Stephen Barnes was only 23 years old when he was convicted for the death of 16-year-old Kimberly Simon. Kimberly, at the end of her day, had been walking to a friend's house around 6 p.m. She was found assaulted and left on the side of a dirt road in Utica, New York in 1985. Eyewitnesses claim they had seen Stephen's truck in the area around the time of the assault, and one police officer even claimed to have seen a man matching Stephen's description. At the time of the assault, Stephen was inside the bowling alley with his brother-in-law, where they stayed all night to enjoy games. Several defense witnesses testified that they saw a young woman getting into a truck along the road that was clearly not his truck. However, Stephen was questioned for 12 straight hours and even given a polygraph test, which came back inconclusive. At that point, he was released without any charges. However, two years later, investigators were still working the case with no new leads. They then asked Stephen to submit blood, saliva, and hair samples. Before he knew it, Stephen was arrested on charges of assault and more. To start with, the DNA testing of Barnes' samples proved to be inconclusive. A criminalist testified that she conducted a photographic overlay of fabric from the victim's genes and an imprint on Barnes' truck and determined that the two patterns were similar. The criminalist also testified that two hairs collected from Barnes's truck were microscopically similar to the victim's hairs and dissimilar from Barnes's hair. She added that no hairs similar to Barnes's samples were found on the victim's body. Serological evidence was also introduced during trial, but it didn't point to Barnes being the killer. Finally, the lab compared soil samples taken from Stephen's truck with dirt samples taken from the crime scene a year after the murder. It was then testified that they had similar characteristics. Microscopic hair analysis, soil comparison, and fabric print analysis have not been validated scientifically. Yet it was these three unvalidated pieces of evidence that were used in Barnes's conviction. A forensic analyst testified at his trial that no fingerprints collected from Barnes's truck matched the victims. And although tire print comparison had never been a validated forensic practice, the tracks from the crime scene were compared with Barnes's truck tires and investigators determined that they did not match. It was then that the prosecution introduced the testimony of a jailhouse informant who told the court Barnes confessed to him while in jail awaiting trial more than two years after the crime. The informant, Robert Stolo, was in custody on forgery and larceny charges. He met Barnes in jail, where they were apparently on the same cell block for about a week. Stolo, however, was housed for that week several cells away from Barnes and couldn't remember when or where this conversation happened. Stolo, who had reportedly received at least a one-year sentence for his crime, only served six months for his testimony. And just like that, based on the lies of a criminal and inconclusive circumstantial evidence, Stephen Barnes was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. He attempted to appeal to the courts, but was rejected. All hope seemed to be lost. Until 1993, when the Innocence Project began representing Barnes and secured DNA testing on his behalf in 1996. At that time, testing came back inconclusive once again due to technology barriers. A decade later, in 2007, the Innocence Project reopened the case. The new tests yielded conclusive results on evidence, none of which matched Barnes. After 20 years in prison, Stephen Barnes was a free man on November 25, 2008. His exoneration became official on January 9, 2009, when prosecutors announced that they were dropping all charges. Because of cases like Barnes's, the New York Bar Association wants the law to require corroborating evidence before jailhouse snitches can testify. Judges would also have to instruct juries they must cautiously consider witness credibility in light of any benefit they'd get. Some people worry that such a law could discourage witnesses from testifying altogether. However, the number of false convictions in our justice system surrounding this practice are staggering. A Northwestern University Law School survey in 2004-2005 
found that 51 out of 111 death row inmates around the country who were later exonerated had been convicted with testimony against them from snitches. In some cases, other suspects. In capital cases, snitches were the most common contributor to bad convictions, followed by erroneous eyewitness identification in 25%, false confessions in 14%, and false or misleading scientific evidence in 10%. Today, jailhouse snitches and informants are hardly used during trials, if at all. Oneida County District Attorney Scott McNamara told sources, we all want to get it right in regards to re-examining evidence in possible wrong convictions. To this day, investigators are still working to identify the real killer in Kimberly Simon's case. In fact, there's still a $5,000 reward for anyone who has information about possible suspects. Barnes now works with youths through Oneida County, New York Workforce Development. He sees his mother, Sylvia Bouchard, who worked with the Innocence Project for years to exonerate Barnes on a daily basis. She told sources, there's not enough money in the world that would mean more to me than having Stephen's freedom. He stops in every morning at 6 a.m. to check on me. And when my son walks through the door, you can't put a price on that. In 2011, Barnes won a settlement for $3.5 million from the state for his wrongful conviction. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.